Council Chambers. Uh, about the invocation, senior pastor from the Presbyterian Church, Brad. Roger Brad. <laughs> Brad Roger. Nice Morning, Mr. Mayor. Morning, uh, members of the council. Thank you for the privilege of having the opportunity to open us in prayer. I invite you to bow your heads and hearts and join with me as we speak with our Heavenly Father. Good morning, Lord. We give you thanks and praise for this and every new day that you give to us. We thank you for the gift of life and the, for the fact that we have taken breath this morning and our heart continues to beat. You are indeed sovereign over all and we thank you and praise you for the life you've entrusted to us. We thank you also for the leaders that you have called to lead this city. We trust that you are the God of all wisdom and we pray that you would give them your wisdom for the tasks that they take in part this morning. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for all those in the city, in the police force, in the first responders who are taking care of our city. We pray that you would bless them, that you would protect them in all they do. And we pray these things in the name of the God in whom I trust. Amen. Amen. We're leading the Pledge of Allegiance and a count of three. One, two, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Mr. Roll call, please. Council Member Bogaz. Here. Council Member Purden. Here. Council Member Carr. Here. Mayor Steinmeier. Here. Council Member Corey. Here. Council, Council Member Fullick. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, we got approval of the agenda. With all these officers here, we're going to move them up after public comment, which will be next on here. Um, so if that's all right with everybody, we got a vote on that? Yeah. No. no. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move him around. Okay. Uh, well, the mayor's welcome. Thank you all for coming. We are the government. We, um, we the people are us. Yeah, but I work for you. You know, you guys all work. We all work for the betterment of the city of Bonita Springs. And I thank you for thank you all. And now we'll go to public comment on any ag agenda items except A, 8A, and 12A, and 12B. Any public comments, please? Oh, good. Uh, oh, we got Mr. Mayor. I think there's one. Yes, ma'am. Turtle time. Yeah. All right. Good morning. My name is Caroline Crew. I live at 3561 Lakemont Drive in Benita Springs. And I'm here today to. Oh, that's okay. I'm here today to represent um, Turtle Time, which is comprised of over 100 volunteers who walk Benita Beach. Big Hickory Island, Fort Myers Beach, and Bunch Beaches daily. If you're out there around dawn, look for the yellow shirts. We're really hard to miss. We look for turtle nests and later for nest hatches. We collect the data for each nest and submit it to the state, and then we stake the nest for identification. The proposed turtle ordinance article 11, chapter 7, as written. The, 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 there will be a public hearing on the turtle ordinance. Oh. Later, later today. Oh, do you know what time? Well, it'll probably be in about a half an hour or so. But oh, okay. So then I should speak at that time. If you have comments specifically to the to the that's what my code changes. I please wait. Okay, oh. I will do that. Okay, you Thank can't you. miss me. I'm going to stay here because I got the yellow shirt. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, my mother was the first turtle. But anyway, back in '90. Um, okay, uh, Jesse. I guess you got to. Do your thing with the uh, officers. Or, or I have one more. Okay. One more comment. Public comment. <laughs> My name is Michael Robinson, and I'm the chairman of the uh, Outreach Advisory Committee. I'm asking the council to approve the vendor for the Fiesta Benita that we're going to be having in September of this year. The, we've had this vendor in the past, and they've done a good job. And there's been no problems, no issues. So I'm asking for your approval, your blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I guess you're on deck here. We've got an honor 
a lieutenant for 40, 44 years or so. He started when he was 10. He's going to retire. He's in good shape. And uh, I really, he came looking for me after the storm. He actually found me. <laughs> my, he saw my car across the street washed away. So he's really a, a blessed man. Before I uh, shake your hand and give this to you um, and, and read this off for everybody, I just want to say that uh, when you took over uh, as community police, uh, leading and running it up in our city, uh, I met you and I was like, this guy looks like he's the real deal. And you have been all that and more. Uh, things have been solved under your watch in record time. Uh, my district specifically uh, in Rosemary Park is the safest it's ever been. Uh, and that's a testament to you, your officers, the work you guys do in the streets every single day. From the bottom of my heart, uh, from me and everybody in District 2 and around the city, we appreciate your dedication to us and everything that you've done. So thank you for that. Now, let me read this. City of Benita Springs, certificate of recognition, proudly presents Lieutenant Jeffrey Detkus in recognition of your 44 years of public service that included time served in the United States Army, Chief of Police in Newport, Kentucky, and serving as a member of, I'm sorry, as a member of the Lee County Sheriff's Office from September 24th, 2007 to July 1st, 2023, which is today. It is with sincere appreciation that the city of Bonita Springs thanks you for your dedication and your commitment to keeping our community safe. We wish you a wonderful future with plenty of time to enjoy your family and friends. Congratulations. And for the record, when the, when the mayor said he's in shape, this guy's at the gym every morning, like six in the morning I go there. He's already been there sweating, so good job. Um, as you know, we are government light, and so many of our resources are contracted out. That does not mean that we are all one team. And uh, Jeff and I have had the opportunity to serve the city during Hurricane Irma, <laughs> COVID-19, and now Ian. And uh, having a big brother in Jeff has been amazing, a great support for me as well. Um, I just wanted to just share a little prayer of St. Michael's, the patron saint of police officers, because I think this embodies your dedication, not only to the city of Benita Springs, but how you hold yourself to not only us as city employees, but to your team. Uh, a police officer's prayer. Lord, I ask for courage, courage to face and conquer my fears, courage to take me where others will not go. I ask strength, strength of body to protect others and strength of spirit to lead others. I ask for dedication, dedication to my job, to do it well, dedication to my community, to keep it safe. Give me, Lord, concern for those who trust me and compassion for those who need me. And Lord, through it all, be by my side. And you've been by our side, Jeff. So thank you. And these are for Mrs. Deckis because I will tell you one thing about Jeff. He is extremely honest, and I've learned that. And so he may not always tell you what you want to hear, and as a lady, I understand that completely, but he will tell, definitely tell you what you have to hear and what you need to hear. So this is from Mrs. Deckis from us with her, our appreciation to her. Jeff's always in the middle. And we should come down.
<laughs> Thank you, Mike. This is the first reading of a zoning ordinance of the City of Bonita Springs, granting a variance from LDC Section 4-2399C2, which requires a setback of 5 feet to allow a setback of 3.1 feet along the northern side property line for a cantilevered structure on a residential property in Bonita Springs and providing an effective date. I move, move to the second reading. Second. And I, call, please, Mike. Yes, please. And I apologize for the record. It, this was not supposed to be a public hearing. It was just the first reading. Yeah. Okay. Mike, roll call, please. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Emergency prayer. Hey, <laughs> here we go. We got the, Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. At this time, I'd ask uh, Chris Campbell to come forward. He is going to present um, an update on emergency preparedness for the current hurricane season, as well as uh, we'll have a brief um, introduction of each of our community partners and their updates as well. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Give me one second. I got a PowerPoint. You, you, you've got some experience? Oh. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. In about 15 years or what? Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. I uh, just want to give you a brief overview and update uh, of our actions in preparation for emergency management and response uh, in conjunction with some of our community partners. Uh, we continue throughout the year to review our plan to make sure it's accurate and concurrent with federal emergency management and state agencies. Uh, staff participates with Lee County Emergency Operations Center in training and ongoing local mitigation strategies, as well as disaster advisory council meetings. Uh, continued staff training with federal emergency management and Florida Department of Emergency Management courses. Uh, we continue with equipment maintenance and inventory uh, for when we are activated. Uh, ongoing year-round preparations for storm drain, debris management, locations of points of distribution, and outreach and education programs within the community for private stormwater conveyance maintenance, uh, tie-downs for trailers in conjunction with city ordinance, and outreach with our partner agencies. 
Uh, emergency management is a cycle, year-round preparedness. Uh, once we're prepared, we can effectively respond uh, for a faster recovery and continued mitigation of risk. Again, this is an ongoing cycle. Uh, in the event of activation, in accordance with the uh, ICS, uh, the city's command structure changes. We have an incident commander and command staff, which include, includes public information officers, liaisons who are at the emergency operations center during activation, safety officers, operations sections, planning managers, and logistics and finance. Uh, this is expandable and collapsible depending upon the event. Uh, and also for daily operations during an activation after we send out our teams for damage assessments, uh, we do daily incident action plans to identify uh, what we need to do, who's responsible for doing it, and what resources are needed, and how do we effectively communicate that. Uh, as a result of those daily, as they call IAPs, uh, there may be resources that are needed to effectively uh, assess, plan, and act. Uh, we will identify those resources if we are unable to fulfill those resources, we will communicate with the county. Uh, our liaisons will uh, put in a request through WebEOC. The county will assist to see if they can fulfill those resources. If not, they will identify uh, state resources or federal resources as available. Uh, we have a new acronym this year that we're looking at, FROC, which is Florida Recovery Obligation Calculation. So this is a new project uh, by Florida Emergency Management or Florida FDEM, Florida Department of Emergency Management. Uh, for category A and B claims through public assistance, uh, those are your debris removal programs and your emergency protective measures. Uh, that's for reimbursement of funds. Uh, if we decide to opt in on this program, uh, it would expedite reimbursements uh, by opting in, the city would be guaranteed the 20% uh, expedited reimbursement. Uh, if we complete a survey, uh, provide that to the state for review so that they can assess our plan, uh, we would be eligible for a 50%. And after a post-disaster post survey, uh, up to 80%. Uh, that would involve uh, training with staff, communication, that would minimize our risk with claims uh, and it's something we're currently exploring uh, for this year. Uh, their goal is to provide streamlined faster process and uh, to simplify the process for filing. So uh, once we decide we want to opt in we'll let you know. And that's it. Well, myself, if you have any questions. Uh, you have any questions from the council? Yes, I have sure. a question. Sure. Where does the training take place if you so choose for each person to be trained? Uh, it's throughout the state, so they have a uh, online portal. More than likely, the last one was at Lee County Emergency Operations. Some of the some of the training is online. Uh, it's going to align with uh, FEMA training, <coughs> but primarily with state forms. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, we also have members from Bonita Springs Utilities here to provide an update, as well as the fire district and um, LCSO. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, council, mayor, citizens of Bonita Springs. I'm Alan Perry with Bonita Springs Utilities, and I'm here to tell you that uh, Bonita Springs Utilities is ready for the next storm. Uh, we were the only water utility in Lee County to not issue a boil water notice for the utility, uh, and we had water restored to Benita Beach within seven days after Ian's landing. Uh, however, we did lose 67 lift stations due to storm surge, um, but the sewer system is operational now. Um, we're now in the mitigation phase of the sewer system for permanent repairs, and we're investi investigating things like telescoping, lift stations, and submersible. Uh, submersible 
lift stations. And that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Sure. Just the, um, the lift stations that went out. I remember it wasn't actually they were destroyed. It was the computer boards. That is correct. So how are we going to mitigate that in the future, knowing that we could have that problem again? There's, we're, we're investigating several areas. Like there, there's lift stations that actually raise to um, the one we're looking at right now, right, goes about 10 feet. So if it's four, you know, you're, the pad's four, you're looking at a 14 foot at the bottom of the <coughs> lift station. Marco Island currently uses uh, raise, uh, raisable panels in their lift station. The uh, salt water ruins them. Correct. My question was what Nigel was going to ask, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Alex. We have Benita Springs Fire District here as well. Good morning, City Council. My name is Benjamin Avis. I'm the Public Safety Director for Lee County, and I want to thank the manager's office and, and uh, all of you for the opportunity to come down to, to speak this morning. We're now three weeks into hurricane season and already tracking our second storm of the year, so uh, our message really in the community has been about preparedness, and our messaging this year is no different than it has been in previous years with really three key things that we are stressing in the community. So the first is you should have a family emergency plan and you should have an emergency supply kit. And the emergency supply kit is a uh, thing that you can use year round, whether it's a hurricane, a tropical event, a uh, forest fire, a wildfire, a uh, tornado, any of those things can occur at any, uh, any time. So it's a great opportunity to review your emergency supply kit and make sure that it's ready. Uh, also, you should have a family emergency plan. And you should review that plan, especially for where you would evacuate to if you're in a zone that's uh, susceptible to storm surge or flooding. Uh, have that planned in advance and know exactly where you would go. Secondly, you need to know your zone, and that's not just for your evacuation zone, but also for flooding. Uh, and there's a great tool on the, on the Lee County website. If you go to leegov.com and scroll down uh, just below the main banner, you can type in your address and it will display both your evacuation zone as well as your flood zone. And that's important because when we do make the announcements on evacuations, you need to know your zone in advance and whether it's time for you to uh, to leave the area. Excuse me. I'm yes, sorry. Um, ask me. You, may, may I ask? I, that's why I asked him to be excused and asked you. May I ask a question? Whatever. Could you repeat the website, please, sure. Alex? It's Benjamin. Le sorry. Yeah, leegov.com, and that's the county's website. And if you scroll down just beyond the top bar, you'll see a, a space where you can type in your address and that will take you to the resident information tool that displays all that information. The third thing that we wanna to stress to the community is that you need to be ready and prepared when a storm is forecast to impact our area. When we call for an evacuation, that is not the time to be securing loose items in your yard or putting up your storm shutters. That is the time to evacuate. So when a storm is forecast to impact our area and it's two or three days out, that's the time to start taking the, the necessary precautions, bringing loose items in from your yard, putting up storm shutters, uh, securing important documents, having all of those things together so that you can immediately evacuate when the evacuation order is called for. And as we've talked with people in the community, we've learned that people that took these steps during Hurricane Ian were not only better prepared for the storm, but they were also better prepared for the impacts and the aftermath and the days following Hurricane Egan. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of things relative to your Mercy Operations Plan and uh, the presentation that you heard just a few minutes ago. The, the coordination and the cooperation between the, the city and the county is exceptional. We have municipal calls with the, the city manager and, and her team and our county leadership. Uh, those are occurring daily and more frequently as necessary. We have uh, a liaison, actually, as he was talking about the liaison officer in the EOC. Uh, they're about four feet to my left when we're sitting in the EOC, and that is a direct conduit from the city to the county so that any emergency requests that, that need to be made can immediately be brought to our attention and we can find ways to assist the city. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. No, thank you. Okay, thank you.
Good morning, Council. Uh, Greg DeWitt, your uh, Benita Springs Fire Department Fire Chief. Uh, you know, I'm here to tell you that the partnership that we have with Lee County, with Benita Springs City Council, with BSU, and with Chris and everybody at uh, Community Services, we're there to assist. As you know, in Hurricane Ian, you guys stayed with us at Station uh, 24. Same thing with Hurricane Irma. You guys are always, always welcome. Uh, and I'll steal it from C Sheriff Carmine Marcino. You know, it's one team, and that's the way I felt about it. I used to sit up there. I did sit up there. And I know that the partnership that we have today is stronger than ever. And, you know, we've made changes out at Station 24. It's more resilient. The, the, uh, our generators are always uh, maintained. Every four months, they're maintained. They're looked at. So we're always ready for that next storm. And as a community, uh, we're better for it. Uh, with you guys there, with Arlene, the city manager, assistant city manager, Laura Taylor, your um, your PIO, you know, there's nothing we can't do. And if for some reason Arlene can't get a hold of the EOC, we have a direct conduit. Uh, for the for those of you that don't know it, our station 24 is the South Geographical EOC. So we take input from San Carlos, Estero, and Benita Springs. And one thing I'll add, and it's an testament an attestment to uh, Lieutenant Deckus back there. You know, the way that we work it is, is as the storm came across and uh, uh, Hurricane Ian came in, you know, we were the first ones to fill winds. So we were the first ones to shut down. But then we were the first ones to get back out on the street along with our Lee County deputies and our Lee County Sheriff's Office as force protection. And we were down on the, on the Hickory Island before anybody else was going out there. You know, sometimes it was uh, at our own detriment. It was a little bit dangerous, but uh, that's what we're paid to do, and that's why we're out there. And just know that if, if Arlene or any of the city can't get a hold of the EOC up there and need things, we'll get a hold of them for you, or we'll put it through on our behalf and, you know, kind of push those bus buttons and push it up uh, as fast as we can. And you guys all know that whatever we have, you're welcome to, whether it's food, water, gas, um, shelter so uh and just so everybody knows i know that councilwoman uh, jamie bogas has been giving you guys updates we're hoping to be back into station 27 hopefully by august 1st we're probably about 80 percent complete right now just waiting on some as everything else in the world supply chain issues so uh I, if anybody has any questions whatsoever i'm here to answer them or try to uh hickory hickory boulevard was quite a deal it was it you guys, was you guys were the first ones down there with this great big what was it? brush trucks are our brush trucks uh, along with yeah. lee county sheriffs with their gators so you know we went down there you know we can't do it up without the sheriffs because you know anywhere we go unfortunately in this day and age there was looting i know i think it was by the time we got down there lieutenant decus that we had people already down there starting to loot and you know two o'clock in the morning i know we were out there with the lieutenant and there were people getting pulled over because they'd already been to places and getting kayaks and people's home so uh we can't do it without our partnership with lee county eoc lee county sheriffs bsu and you guys so but let you know that we're out there protecting you every day very good fabulous all right thank you um lcsl Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, on behalf of Sheriff Marcino, Captain Lee, who is uh, vacationing in Rio, uh, thank you. Uh, I, first of all, thank you very much for everything today. I, I really appreciate that. I um, wasn't expecting it, so it was quite a shock, uh, especially to see uh, all of uh, uh, my men and women here uh, who, by the way, uh, I could not do any of this without them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's pretty easy when you hand pick everyone that's on your unit and you put them out there, it, it makes your job very easy. So uh, I couldn't do it without some of those key players. Um, and I, I really appreciate them uh, very much, uh, Sergeant Bryce Harden and uh, Corporal Bobby Hunter, to be exact. I, I, I couldn't even do this job uh, every day without both of them. Uh, they, uh, they probably keep me afloat more than, uh, than I could say. Uh, as far as the hurricane goes, listen, we're ready every day, no matter what that what, what comes down the road for us at the sheriff's office. Uh, our equipment is maintained uh, flawlessly. 
Uh, we maintain it on a, on a weekly basis to make sure everything is up and running. Uh, everything is out and on the road as we speak. Uh, we know when to bring it in. We know when to, uh, to maintain it, when to put it at the CP sub, when to take it out to station uh, 24, store it so that it's ready to go as soon as the storm is over. Uh, we are already monitoring the next storm that's coming down the, the road so that in the event that we need to get out and get going, we're, we're ready. Uh, the sheriff has already got us, uh, our IMT out there, and they're already up and moving. So there's no chance that uh, anything slips by us at the sheriff's office. Uh, he has already got everybody on a high alert. So uh, like, like the fire chief just said, we're, we're ready to go no matter what the uh, emergency is that comes down to the tube. So uh, I won't bore you with all the minor details, but I will tell you that uh, if there's anything that the city needs at any given time, uh, now that I'm on my way out the door, Captain Lee, Lieutenant Markovich, they're, uh, they're there to, to help the city do whatever they need to, to get that done. So thank you very much. We appreciate that. Are there any questions? I won't let Lieutenant go too far. So that concludes our hurricane update. If you'd like us, we can move right into the second presentation, which is the update from Lee County Sheriff's Office Community Policing Unit. And Lieutenant Deckus will have some updates for you as we do annually. Okay. I need my goggles for that one. <laughs> Currently, the uh, Community Policing Unit has 19 total deputies. Uh, we have two sergeants, one detective, two narcotics detectives, and 14 patrol deputies. Uh, we, this year, uh, starting in January uh, and working our way forward, uh, we were still uh, up and running with our uh, hurricane operations. So we had a 24-hour patrol uh, throughout the city uh, that we were working on as far as the beach goes, as far as all of our hurricane uh, hard hit areas uh, all along our waterways, uh, all along the uh, hard hit areas of the waterways. Uh, we had 24-hour patrols to make sure that that looting wasn't happening. And uh, that lasted probably into uh, March. I believe it was early March before we actually broke off those 24-hour patrols. Uh, so that we did take a little hit on our numbers uh, because of that, uh, because it does take a, lot of, a, a good hit on our manpower running a 24-hour operation. Uh, but either way, uh, we, we were able to really you know, squash anything that came down the road as far as... Uh, 24 hour in our looting and, and, and all those type of, of things that happen uh, in those areas. Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, people will take advantage of those types of things, uh, but they do. Uh, we noticed that, uh, like the fire chief said right away um, after the hurricane, uh, we, you know, as early as uh, really as early as the winds died down enough for us to get out, uh, early as uh, eight nine o'clock at night, they were already out trying to, to loot and, and do things. So we were already having problems that early on uh, in the hurricane. So we find that, you know, our, our guys and gals are, are out there uh, already starting to stop people and pull people over and, and find out and identify who they are. So those 24-hour patrols are necessary, and they definitely take a toll on our manpower. Um, the art festival operation that we had uh, went off without a hitch. That's uh, three months. Uh, we have a whole weekend of art fest. Um, goes off without a hitch, uh, takes a little bit of manpower to do that. Uh, we have no problem uh, every year with that. Um, we have Cafe of Life every year that we run the Easter egg hunt. Uh, we have four deputies that go out there and, and help with the uh, Easter egg hunt. Uh, we didn't have any problems with that. Uh, our Memorial Day operation, I'm sure that uh, if anybody went near the beach, uh, you see us out there every Memorial Day, everybody works down there. Uh, we had no problems with that. Just to give you a little idea, because of Ian and the amount of uh, empty properties down there and, and the problems we've had down there with Ian, uh, this year our biggest issue down there was parking, uh, as it usually is. However, this year we wrote 145 parking citations down there. They were parked everywhere. Uh, no matter where, they, the only thing, good thing was they weren't on the streets, but they were in every lot, every, they were trying to get out on the beach and park, you name it, they were parking there. Uh, so we, uh, we stayed down there, we stayed busy. Uh, we didn't have not one burglary down there. We didn't have not one crime down there, not one fight, not one alcohol complaint. And that, uh, that shows you that what, uh, what those uh, 14 patrol deputies can do when they, uh, when they all get together and start to, 
to really kind of put their, their mind to it. So they, uh, they were out there really kind of pushing and, and doing the right things. Uh, so um, Memorial Day was a great success for us. Uh, we had 16 burglary suppression operations for the last six months. Uh, that's just basically guys, they get together at night to make sure that we don't have any burglaries. And uh, lo and behold, they were able to kind of hold the lid on that all year long. Uh, so all of that worked out really well for us uh, as far as uh, the burglary operations go. Um, to give you an idea of how many calls for service we had, uh, I'm gonna go through the numbers, the total activity for, the, uh, for zones five and six, which is the city of Bonita Springs. So we had 26,759 calls for service in the city of Bonita Springs. Of those 26,000, the community policing deputies handled 6,637 of those. So we took, we actually took those, that, that amount. So the 6,600 of them, we handled ourselves. Um, of those, we took like about 91 crime reports. We made 46 arrests. And of those 46 arrests, uh, some of those were uh, Detective Ortino's arrests. And she had uh, just about 71 arrests. So that detective spot is burning it up. So she's able to get a lot of those what we call prolific offenders, those offenders that are consistently out there doing the same crimes over and over. She's able to get off the street because we have our own detective down here in Bonita Springs working. And uh, that works out for us so well. So when you all added that in there, I'm from Kentucky, so you're going to get that y'all in there every now and then. Sorry about that. But when you all added that detective in there, that, that really helped us out because she can focus on our cases down here in Bonita Springs and work forward from there. So it really works out well for us. We had a little over 2,500 traffic stops, uh, the Bonita Springs uh, community policing uh, folks did. Uh, we had about uh, 628 of those were speeding and red light runners, 628. Uh, we did 172 crosswalk operations and um, we wrote about 3,300 warnings wrote 539 tickets, actual citations. Uh, we had 10 DUIs and we did 46 motorcycle operations. Now what's important about the motorcycle operations, I'm sure every one of you at some point has had that complaint about those motorcycles, screaming around the city and doing all those uh, you know, crazy uh, you know, up and down Imperial you know, racing back and forth. Well, with Sheriff Marcino's zero tolerance now with street racing, we've actually started uh, taking those forfeitures, you know, taking their motorcycles if we can, if we catch them. And uh, recently, we've had uh, two forfeitures already of the motorcycles. So we started using helicopters to track them, and we've actually taken motorcycles. So now, you know, we've done above and beyond to make sure we can stop that street racing. So we're not. We're not playing around anymore with them. So if they race through Bonita and we catch you, we're gonna take your stuff from you. So that's uh, one of Sheriff Marcino's zero tolerance things that we're gonna do and, and we're just gonna keep up with that. Uh, so recently we've taken uh, about 241 crash reports. Our community outreach, that includes the Cafe of Life, 150 contacts we had with them. So we've gone there about 150 times and either done some type of community outreach with them or walked through businesses or done some type of things with them. Um, that includes the YMCA, Cafe for Life, all of those types of things. The one, there's a couple of things that really kind of stand out with community policing uh, that we really uh, hang our hat on. Uh, one of those is school checks with everything going on with the schools. We did, uh, we have six schools really in the, in the city of Bonita Springs that we check a lot. Uh, we had just a little over a thousand school checks. So in that six months, we checked the schools a little over a thousand times. So we're rolling in, getting out, going inside, checking on the schools a little over a thousand times. So that's every day that they have school, we're getting out and checking on them. Uh, we're, we're, we're very proud of those numbers. Um, and that's everybody on day shift getting out and checking on them. The other thing is uh, what we call our juvenile offender checks. And uh, we check on those, those kids because they seem to do most of our crimes, breaking cars. I shouldn't say breaking cars, they open the doors because folks aren't locking them up. Uh, we did about 399 of those. Our narcotics unit, uh, they have about 14 cases open. 
uh, made about four drug arrests and uh, executed one search warrant. So that gives you an idea that those, those uh, drug cases are starting to drop. That means we're doing our job out there by stopping cars and, and really kind of putting the pressure on the drugs. So that's all working out for us really well. And while some of those numbers seem a little bit lower than they were in the past, I think a lot of that has to do with Ian because we actually had those 24 hour patrols rolling into March. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, we're right on track. I think everything is uh, looking really, really good for the uh, community policing. Um, we're busier than ever. Uh, I think the city is booming. And um, you know, as, as things move forward with uh, community policing, um, I think, uh, Lieutenant Markovich and uh, Captain Lee, I think, are, are right on track to get things done. So. Yes, Chris. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> with all the focus that's been on gun shootings, especially with respect to schools and so forth, uh, are we, as your department, as your community policing effort, been trained to avoid a situation like Uvalde in, in the way that the police responded to that? that try to go in and, and take care of the shooter as quickly as possible? That's a great question. Just yesterday, our district, we take actually a certain amount out of the district. Every district does this, and we do this several times a month, and they train in the schools. So everyone has had active shooter training, and we do it about twice a month. We pull them out, they go to a school, we pick different schools, we've done it here in Bonita, and they go and train for that exact scenario. Uh, Sergeant Harden, who is in the uh, community policing, he is actually an active shooter trainer, and he goes through that with them on a regular basis. So yes, they are active shooter trained, and they do know exactly what to do in that situation. Uh, and, and again, that goes back to the, the, uh, the number of school checks that we've had, um, and that's what they're doing. They're going in there, they're walking around, they're paying attention to what's going on, and they're there for that specific reason, to make sure that they, they understand you know, where all the exits are, where the kids are. We know where all the problem kids are. So we're, our focus is just that, to, to make sure that the kids know that they're safe. Thank you. Uh, let's say uh, the principal finds a gun, a handgun in the, in the school, somebody's locker, what, what happens then? The, uh, the school resource officer is notified then that school resource officer will notify their chain of command and then they, they ultimately will notify us. And uh, that school is take that school, that student is taken from the classroom and then the, the paperwork is done and they're actually removed and arrested. Ms. Miller, may I? Yes, um, you mentioned that you, ha you issued 140 citations mostly for parking on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. Was that a fine or just don't do this again? Uh, those, most of those are fines. Okay. Those, those are the citations were the ones that were written for fines. The warnings, we didn't even count we wrote so many. <laughs> so they were just everywhere. They were flooding out onto the street. They were blocking sidewalks. They were just everywhere. Uh -huh. so. And then the motorcycles that you, you uh, confiscate, what mm -hmm. do you do with them? Uh, they're actually taken in and then there's a process that they go through through the court system. Once the, the court system awards them back to the sheriff's office, they're auctioned off. Cool. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. what, what gives you the right to take the property? I'm sorry? What gives you the right to confiscate these motorcycles? If they're used in the commission of street racing, the statute actually allows us to take them and do the forfeiture packet on them and then the court decides are we able to take them? And if the court says yes, then we can do a, then we can get them through forfeiture through the court system, and then we can take those funds and apply them back to law enforcement. Okay, that's good. Uh, every night. Very nuts. <laughs> and not Harley's. No. <laughs> Anything else, Jamie? Um, just in respects to the school, I think the kids go like 180 days a year. And if people are doing a thousand school checks, I think that's that's amazing. I think the kids right. are safe and 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 that that that's, that number is really high because if you look throughout Lee County, I mean we're so busy with calls for service. Our guys are constantly stopping in the schools. Our detectives will go there and actually do paperwork at the schools, and just to make sure 
that you know we're in there and, and in there for a while i mean they might sit there for an hour they might sit there for 45 minutes they're not just popping in and saying hey we're here for five minutes they're going in and spending time there we're making sure and that is one of the sheriff's primary goals to make sure that you know this is not going to happen here in lee county and so you know those are kind of things that that uh, we're actually doing so Seeing a patrol car parked along the side of the road makes you slow down. It doesn't matter if there's even an officer in it. It's just to know that law enforcement is in the area. And you, sometimes you do a where you get a whole bunch of people at one, one time in one area, show a force, what do they call that? We do, we do traffic operations. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll focus on red light runners or we'll focus on speeders or whatever. And that's when you see a lot of, of cars all stacked up in one area. They're focusing on something of that nature. And so if you have one car stop for speeding, you might have the other car stop for they failed to move over. Then the next one might run a red light. And so you'll see them stacked up along the roadway. The good thing is in the city of Benita Springs and those enhanced, what you're getting out of that is all of that enhanced law enforcement, right? You're getting more bang for your buck as you're all of a sudden seeing more and more cruisers out there that's slowing traffic down, that's making folks pay attention. And I think that's what gives you that, that enhancement. And I think Jamie's point showing up at the schools and staying there is also a great deterrent to don't mess with us. Yes, ma'am, I agree. Good point, uh, yeah, real quickly, sir. Um, number one, I want to thank you because, you know, most of us up here know at this point because I've said it over and over, but a lot of people don't realize, you know, when the initial contract was started with y'all, we were a 40,000 person city. We're over, well over 60,000 now, and you guys continue to deliver. So it's just, it's an amazing testament to the hard work of the people uh, over at LCSO. So it can't be overstated how grateful we are for that type of an increase. Uh, and until we added the detective and then this last budget year, you had no increase at all. So to be able to have that level of service with continuity is absolutely amazing. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about LPRs too, how they serve community policing and the benefits of them? Uh, license plate readers or LPRs is what they're called are actually readers that actually ping on license plates and you're able to actually put them on roadways and they will read 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 license plates a minute. And so you can box in roadways and read license plates. So if you have a high crime area or if you have a problem area where you think you might be having an issue later on down the road, you could put a couple of those LPRs and they'll read all those license plates, say overnight or over a week period of time. And that actually gives you your detective can go back and say, okay, so we had a uh, car break in on Thursday. I can go back to Thursday, look at a time period and say, okay, it was between midnight and six in the morning, pull exactly six midnight to six in the morning and read every license plate between that time. It's not going to be a lot, right? Might be six, might be eight, but either way, pull all those license plates and that gives them a jump off point of where to start their investigation. They are so valuable to law enforcement problem is we only have a few of them in the county right and if you have mobile ones you can move them around if you have permanent ones can't do that so much uh, so that that's the that's the caveat to having mobile uh, LPRs is that they help you in, in your investigation and am I correct in that one of the murders that actually happened this year we had a they were caught in almost record time and it was because of an LPR wasn't it yes sir that is correct uh, we, we caught them within the hour and and caught them off an LPR hit. And how much are these? Uh, they, they range somewhere between about thirty five to thirty seven thousand to forty two thousand. They're, they're somewhere in between there. Just depends on the, the company and the kind that you purchase, actually. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. And I am full size. I'm standing up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for everything. Uh, you know, the city, I, I live in Bonita. I'm not going anywhere. I, you know, I wouldn't go anywhere. Um, 
I, I can't thank everyone enough. So thank you. If you're in town, I want your I want your criticisms. I want your comments. I want you to be involved with the city. Just be careful about pretty that. Pretty certain you will be. <laughs> so I thank you. And he thank found you. me after the storm. He saw my car and walked across the street. And somehow he located me. And, and I was out on Hickory Boulevard. And one of the neighbors snitched and they came to my door. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. Because I had mentioned I was going to stay for the storm. So. That's good policing. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your service. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Okay, we have a consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Councilmember Purden. Aye. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Councilmember Corey. Aye. Councilmember Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Councilmember Bogaz. Uh, Mayor Council items. Uh, we're going to slide by that one. 12A, backyard hens. Our hens. This is a second reading second of. Second reading. Uh, this is a second reading of an ordinance of the city of Bonita Springs, Florida, amending the Bonita Springs Land Development Code, Chapter 4, Zoning to amend section 4-1052-backyard hens, providing for conflicts of law, severability, codification, Scrivener's errors, and modifications that may arise from consideration at public hearing <coughs> and an effective date. <coughs> Morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is the second reading. I know we had a pretty robust discussion on all things hen at the last council meeting. Uh, Really, the whole purpose of these changes is to take what was a pilot program that was limited to 25 uh, permits and make the final adjustment into a permanent program, which essentially removes uh, that number limitation. So uh, <clears throat> we've gone from a maximum of 25 to however many apply. We have at times had all 25 permits issued, and at times we have had fewer than 25 issued. I would assume that if approved today, we'll probably see numbers fluctuate anywhere between 20 to maybe 30 or so permits within the city, uh, depending on the time and depending on, on the interest. And I know that there was a lot of discussion previously on enforcement and what we look for and how these things work. Just a general comment, our problems aren't with those people that permit their backyard hens. Our problem is the people that don't permit their backyard hens. So when we're looking at those that have these permits, we know where they are, we know what they're supposed to have, we know what to look for, and it's very easy to enforce. When we're looking for, not just us, but also uh, neighborhood services, looking for complaints, there is a hen running around my neighborhood and there is no permit associated with it, it's longer to enforce. So the idea of bringing people kind of into the fold and under the regulations makes things a little bit easier to keep a handle on. So no, we are not looking to become Key West with roosters running around the neighborhood. We do not want to degrade people's quality of life. And no, we are not changing the standards within your uh, homeowners association. We are simply stating that for those within uh, the city of Benita Springs, uh, if your HOA approves or if you do not live in an HOA and you want to apply for a permit, you will be able to get the permit regardless of how many people already have one. That's the intent. So I don't know if there's any further questions or discussions, but duplex is you can't have a duplex. Yes, duplex. you can have a you can have two two and a, and a duplex. Well, multi-family is not allowed, right? Correct. And multi-family starts at four units. Okay, that's good. If I make a motion to approve, because you've a, you've guaranteed we're not going to be the tulips and Holland situation, <laughs> right? Not yet. Just give us. <laughs> okay. Second. Roll call. Any other Pub questions? Public hearing. Oh. Public hearing on the hens. I see none. Okay. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Now we got the turtle, turtle ordinance. It's turtle time. I, I want to hear her first. Can we have the public comment first? And then 
That it's yeah. council's pleasure, but uh, flip to the reading. First. I'll read the title oh, okay. into the record. Okay. This is a second reading of an ordinance of the city of Bonita Springs, Florida, repealing and replacing the Bonita Springs Land Development Code, Chapter 7, Article 2, Sea Turtles, providing for conflicts of law, severability, codification, scrivener's errors, and modifications that may arise from consideration at public hearing and an effective date. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm Caroline Krupp. I live at uh, 3561 Lakemont Drive in Bonita Springs. You heard my introduction about um, who Turtle Time is, uh, and I'm here to talk about that ordinance. Um, we appreciate that the city is updating the current sea turtle lighting ordinance. You have incorporated the latest state model ordinance. Turtle Time supports the ordinance as written with the exception of one aspect, and that is section 7-45E, which sets the inside to outside light transmittance value to 45% or less. Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission strongly recommends light transmittance standards of 30% inside to outside. This recommendation is based on the most recent research and experience. It benefits all of us. It provides privacy, <coughs> it saves energy, it protects interior settings, and it makes turtle lighting compliance a lot easier for owners and for visitors. Bonita Beach is a relatively narrow beach with nesting habitat in close proximity to the homes. Most of the newly constructed homes feature large windows overlooking the beach. FWC does not consider 45% tint to be effective in preventing sea turtles from disorienting. Adult sea turtles <coughs> will crawl towards visible light. Right now on Bonita Beach, there are 101 nests, and there were 193 false crawls. And that includes one very rare green turtle nest. These nests house eight, 80 to 120 eggs, and when the hatchlings emerge, they run towards the light that is reflected from the gulf. If there are lights on land, they become disoriented and can run in the wrong direction. Bonita Beach has always set a standard of environmental excellence, and you're to be commended for that. Many coastal communities throughout Florida, including Fort Myers Beach, have converted to 15% and 30% light trans transmittance. Say that word five times fast. We strongly urge you to consider incorporating the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission's recommended technology of 30% light transmittance standard in the Bonita Springs Lighting Ordinance. It's good for all of us. Turtle Time would like to thank the, the council and the mayor for your time and your attention to all things turtles and all things beaches, and I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Good morning. I'm Laura Gibson, environmental specialist with uh, community development. I have a brief presentation uh, to go over the changes. I realize that uh, somebody's selling these 45 percent as turtle safe or whatever that's yeah that's the tinting for uh for glass that um, is on the beach side and shore perpendicular side of structures but they were told it was turtle safe so who, who was telling them it was turtle safe because they spent thousands of dollars extra to have that that type of 45 percent is the current um it is in the current current model ordinance language from the state. So the state provides model ordinances for municipalities and counties to adopt in their own regulations. And and the the model ordinance was updated in 2020 from the state. So that's uh, why uh, several municipalities have updated their sea turtle ordinances to meet that, uh, there are several changes in that, but they did maintain the 45% transmittance. However, there is a study going on currently 
by some FWC staff professionals that are, um, seems to be recommending 30%. It has not been published as of yet, and it's not um, available on um, as, as a reference on the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission's website as of yet. Um, I have had some communication with the author of the study on that. I think it's um, the, the city's direction to wait until that's adopted. Um, to I was just curious who my neighbor can, can sue because he was told it was turtle-friendly turtle windows and now he, they're not. Oh, Mr. Forty five percent is still oh, Mr. Mayor, look, just to just clarify because we had a lot of internal staff discussions on this on whether to move to what could be an adopted standard but has not been adopted yet. And the the code as provided provides that even if you have fifteen percent, if there is light visible, you have to still put up treatments and others. So the, the rule is no visible light from either glow nor point source from the beach that could interfere. That, that's the rule, regardless of whatever the percentage states. So it's not that if you're 45% and then you've got a big heat lamp in your, in your house that you're covered. It's not an exemption. So the, the issue about whether we adopt a, lower a higher standard that has not been released from a study that's published just even if Fish and Wildlife study is published, doesn't mean that that will be adopted by the state. So the current standard, think about it as current gas mileage. If the current standard says, you know, 45% works, and there's another there's another uh, policy that's being considered that may change it to lower, until that policy's been adopted, we're, we are not in a position to recommend something additional that would be of a substantial cost to <coughs> property owners and would still require them to make other conditions, including you know, uh, window treatments and things like that to prevent the light displacement. Now, Fort Myers Beach, other communities have, have possibly looked at their own considerations, the fact that there may be homes much <coughs> closer to the beach and other, other considerations to adopt a more stringent standard. The city of Bonita Springs can also adopt a more stringent standard, but for as far as purposes of staff recommendation, we, we went with what the model ordinance says. Okay, and I also had some lights that were supposed to be turtle friendly, and turtle season came on, we changed all these lights, and they no, they aren't. So there's a lot of misinformation out there about, if you can see it from the beach, then it's illegal. Correct. So tur turtle friendly, there's, oh, let me put it clear. If you get a tur turtle friendly light and then you install 500 of them, <laughs> it's, it's the usage of the light, not the necessary the light itself. So obviously there are lights with higher lumen counts. There are other things that, that are more adverse to turtles they don't recommend installing. But whether it's turtle friendly or it's approved per the code, none of this is an exemption from compliance, which is no light glued onto the, onto the beaches. Very good, because we get a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people that don't understand the law it's a lot of work, and, and people get upset. Well, like, you know, I've got a motion light that comes on when somebody comes up to my back door when it goes off in 10 minutes. Well, that's no good either. So it's uh, fun. Have fun out there. So I would, <laughs> you get to enforce this. I would advise to council, as you know, regularly in a normal season, there's a lot of concern regarding turtle lighting, and, and people get concerned of their visibility at night and their own safety navigating with the, with the light changes, um, but this will be extremely different this year as much of the vegetation is not on the islands anymore. And so I believe this is also going to be an enforcement education process for folks who not necessarily understood all of the technolo te technologies of this and that now it's, for lack of a better word, the lights are bleeding across Hickory Boulevard. So this is gonna be very different this year. We're going to utilize it as an as an opportunity to educate folks first. Um, so it, it's going to be an ongoing process, and I I would suggest that when many of you, as some of you, I know Councilmember Carr for sure, have heard in the past concerns from folks out there. I would imagine this would be no different, if not 
if not more. So we're, we're just gearing up and preparing for that. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Is it more expensive to do the 40% versus the 35% by any significant difference? Um, I, I'm not an expert on that. I have heard that um, when you get below a 20% transmittance, that can really escalate the prices. Um, uh, on it, you're, you're speaking about glass tinting, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay, but, but we want to go to 45. Well, we are currently at 45, and that remains the state's direction at this point. So, and we we did in the in the old language, and now in in the new language too. We still we do have provisions for requiring additional window treatments, drapes, curtains, blinds. Well, what if we consider like putting beacons out in the ocean or in the Gulf <laughs> during turtle season? <laughs> Come here, <laughs> and they light up. Well. well they we have buoys out there. Why not do lighting? Well, they, they, they look for a dark beach to even come up to light on. So I think more lighting would... No, no, no. After the birthing season. You know when the turtles hatch? When they hatch, the lights go on. Well, they're, they're still... Sometimes there's some overlap of, of nesting and hatching, too. Yeah, because they, they, they nest for two, three months... And then, so and some of them start hatching as well. So the long and the short of it is, what are you saying that we should in, that we should approve this second reading, or we should increase the um, screening? I mean, and it helps. The, the fact is, if you can see the light on the beach, you're illegal. Doesn't matter if it's 45, 30. 20, if it's lights on at the beach, it's illegal. So I, I would suggest to the Mayor and Council that the staff is recommending we adopt the model ordinance at such time that the state changes the direction. We, be, we will be bringing that back to Council to consider Perfect. changing it. But it is of the Council's discretion if you wish to move you know, to a more uh, precise t tinting. It's just that there could be Costs. We don't know all of those costs associated with that. We also know that this is a very different year out on the beach, and so we're using this as an opportunity for education. But we would, at a minimum, request that you adopt the state ordinance. And then if somebody follows the ordinance and then you change it, do they have to change the screen, or are they grandfathered in? No, they would need to come to current standards. So if, 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 for, if, if the state provides a different direction, then we would bring that back to council for your consideration, and then they would have to follow the, t the ordinance as adopted. That would apply it when they come in for changes. So if, if it's existing, then we would uh, can we wouldn't still have to rip out their their windows and put. But they in. but they most likely would have still have to apply additional window treatments to block the, the light. So motion to approve. Second. Second. Is there any other public comment? Okay. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Councilmember Corey. Aye. Councilmember Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Councilmember Bogaz. Aye. Councilmember Purden. Aye, but is there the ability to have the amendment that Turtle Time discussed included in this? Yeah, bring so it back I, with a green sheet, Jesse. No, no. So I understood the motion was to adopt as presented by staff, which does not include the additional tinting that's what i believe the right so there was a, just to be clear there was two initial requests right from turtle time the first one we did do and this is the second or was this the initial discussion that they had when we first put it out this was the same thing that they wanted i believe there was an email with comments the first time from that the was um that was one of their comments okay. we addressed some of the other uh the other comments um as, and we received further public comment as, as well. So, uh, but the so no, it's not thirty percent is has not been changed. Okay. So, um, logistically, now that we are at the point where I'm the last vote and we've gone this to this point, it, there's no way to undo. You, you would vote against it. I would. Well, even if I voted against it, how would we, can it then be amended anyways? 
at this point. Later. Logistically. I'm just trying to go make us not have to go through the minutia of an entire green sheet to do this when if if this is something that we can still do then no 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 <laughs> you can vote against it if there are other council members who who were under a mistaken impression that it included other changes they can vote move to reconsider their vote based on that information so your your question clarifying the motion is appropriate but if you don't agree with the motion and the ordinance as presented then vote to deny it Okay. So if I were to vote no now and somebody else were to vote uh, to reconsider, then we could discuss adding it and then voting on it with the amendment. Only under those circumstances. Okay. With that being said, I will vote no. Council Member Carr. I'm not quite sure what to exchange here. Because <laughs> I'd like to just like point out to people, you need to do 30 at minimum, but it could change to 45 <coughs> just to give like a heads up to people who are going to invest money it, it would be 45. so if you're if you're in alignment with council member Erden, then but if 45. the light goes on the beach it's illegal whether it's 30 or 45 if the light goes on the beach it's illegal is that right not if it's muted huh not, not if it's, it's muted. I mean, well, what, no lights? Beach. I mean, then why are you so upset about it? If it doesn't go on the beach, it's fine. <laughs> if it goes on the beach, it's illegal. I, I think but my recommendation is to complete the vote. If there are questions of the council members of how it, how it gets enforced, then we can have Laura come up and give a, a brief explanation on, on what happens when a light is sighted or. We had the vote, right? Yeah. No. no. No, we're still in the middle of the vote. So can you well, please tell vote. me? It's the ordinance as written. So you're voting on the ordinance as written. So 45%. Correct. And that is what the turtle folks in green, yellow, uh, no. That's not what turtle time is requesting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Derek. I'm sorry. You can't change it now, yes or no? Did you vote yes or no? No. Good. Motion carried. Thank you. And I felt bullied, I must say. Is that done? What? Everybody vote? Okay, now we're talking about Pueblo Bonita and a $40,000, $400,000 grant sort of thing. Could you explain that? Who's going to explain that? I, I'll, I'll I jump motion in. to approve. Very, very quickly, the, what this item is, is the, the city has a, has a mortgage along with several other um, governments and other entities, uh, nonprofit entities on Pueblo, uh, Pueblo Bonito that is designed to ensure that the property remains as a uh, affordable housing uh, facility. If at some point, say a developer came to them and said, we would like to, we'll, we'll give you $80 million to buy the, buy the property and turn it into condos, then at that point, what this, this renewal of the mortgage would do is that the city would be paid back its mortgage plus interest. So it's, it's not intended to be, they haven't been paying on it, they're not intended to be paid. The purpose of the mortgage is to secure the property as an affordable housing. How do you keep it affordable? It would be, it would be the conditions under which the, the original grant was given. So whatever those conditions were. Motion to approve. Second. Any other comment? Roll call, please. Council Member Corey. Aye. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Aye. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. City Manager's uh, update. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, John Del Murphy would like to provide a quick, quick briefing on permits in Hurricane Ian recovery. Oh, by the way, if you need to go to the bathroom, you're allowed to leave. Oh, we can now? Come back. I'm about ready to tell something exciting. Uh -huh. You don't have to go to the bathroom, do you? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thanks for We're almost done. Uh, <laughs> good morning again. Um, 
permit activity remains consistent with what it was. Um, I didn't bring any slides for you today. However, uh, what we're looking at right now is, is a continuation on what we've seen. Several of you have been in, in the office lately. You've seen that the lobby still remains a popular place to be. And uh, we try to move people there as fast as possible. And we still kind of remain at the same kind of percentage wise where we were at the last meeting. Uh, what we've also started doing for uh, this storm season is after our most recent rains, uh, our inspection team has gone out to go look at a lot of the construction sites that are either dewatering or have uh, berms or have not necessarily finished all their stabilization of, of uh, raw dirt. And so make sure that those are not going to be issues, not only for their sites, but also for their neighbors and things continue with that. So. Uh, we keep moving things along, we keep learning lessons, and so, you know, hope we never have to use them, but I think we're in pretty good shape for right now. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council. I just did also want to advise that Council Member Corey, as your representative for the Resiliency Task Force, received an email. Um, myself and Matt Feeney were copied on it. Um, they are requesting, um, Haggerty's requesting that we have a meeting with them to discuss neighborhood planning in Bonita Springs. Um, we need additional information on that. Um, the idea that was sent in the email was that we would be suggesting an eight to nine block um, location. We just received this information yesterday afternoon. Um, so we will be advising mm -hmm. them that any um, from the resiliency task force consultants. So we'll be advising them that um, that we're going to have the meeting discuss, I think, um, as Council Member Corey comes in, I was discussing the Resiliency Task Force request. Um, we'll meet with them. If any final decisions on recommendations of neighborhoods, we need to bring back to City Council for discussion. If there's any ideas of focus you'd like us to look at, um, we're happy to bring that up in the meeting if there's any, any particular location. We would assume that we'd be focusing on the communities that we identified with you all in City Council when we reviewed our um, CIP lists, which include some resiliency for Pennsylvania, some, some resiliency for um, Rosemary Drive, um, so, so communities where we think that we'll be able to um, utilize funds for. Um, but if there's any particular locations you'd like us to address, also we do need to advise them we have to bring back these reports to City Council for a f full review. So I believe we have a meeting today at two o'clock um, and we were just, asked yesterday for or the day before yesterday for the yesterday I believe for the meeting so but we will continue to advise council as well any other mm. okay and then with that um, if Lisa would come forward for the financial report He'll be much more efficient than I am with this technology. <clears throat> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, Lisa Robertson, um, for the record, here to present your monthly financial report for April. <clears throat> As you can see, we do our, our regular recurring revenue and expenditures. We provide you the consistent graph, and that will help us clearly identify positive and, and um, areas, trends of concern. This is our graph um, with our regular recurring revenue, and it shows the different components of that, significant components, if you will. Um, as we started the beginning of the year, ad valorem taxes, were a higher percentage, and as we move through the year, that will decrease because we collect primarily most of those in November, December, and January, our first few months of our fiscal year, which really just helps us get going with respect to funding our operating expenditures as we move through the year. General fund revenue, this is a comparative slide, fiscal year to date, current year, and immediate prior year. As we've talked about each month, we haven't seen thus far a significant negative impact on our regular recurring revenues a good thing cautionary tale you know with everything going on locally um, nationally you know we're not sure where we're going to head with these the state should be coming out with our new numbers and their economists just do an outstanding job of measuring what they think some of the the 
taxes that are collected statewide, sales tax, which is a big component for us, um, gas tax, things of that nature. They're really dialed into that. So they're going to give us our number that we're going to put into our budget, and that will be a good indicator for us to whether or not um, they see a decrease or if, if they predict maybe a slight increase. Unsure about that. I have been reading a lot that at the state level, the sales tax collections have not <clears throat> um, moved lower as anticipated. Again, not saying that that's going to continue, but we watch and we observe. <clears throat> General fund operating expenditures. Again, these are our regular recurring operating expenditures. We see here almost every category has moved up. That is a reflection of the inflationary period that we're in right now. We'd love to, to see that trend, as everyone would with their households, with everything you're looking at. This is across the board. <clears throat> We'd love to see that turn, but we'll be watching for that, and we'll be adjusting our budget um, estimates for next year that will be coming forward to you later on in July. <clears throat> Restricted revenues. These are your revenues that are legally restricted for a specific purpose, um, roads, um, parks, um, our building fee permits. As you'll see there, um, we had anticipated a decrease in our building permit fees. This that we're experiencing is much more significant, and obviously there were things at play when we adopted our budget <clears throat> that have moved that in that direction. So we're observing that. We're going to make adjust our budget numbers for next year accordingly. Um, and also our, our, our new construction, which are our park impact fees and our road impact fees <clears throat> for because of the downward trend with the new construction that we're seeing in our area. This is not something that's isolated to Benita. It's our whole region particularly. So we'll see how those, how those trend as we head into next year. Uh, gas tax, they're even up a little bit, which they're usually pretty flat and have been for the last five or six years. That's yes, sir. The, that is the local option taxes? Local option gas tax. So those are, again, ones that are collected. Um, it doesn't say tax. It doesn't say gas on there. Oh, I, I apologize about that. We'll, we'll make sure we get that in there. Local option yes, yes. taxes. Yes, it should say fuel tax. tax. Okay. Thank you so much for pointing that out. Yeah, we'll get that added in there. Um, but again, that's something that's collected statewide, and the economists are really, at the state level, are really dialed into that with respect to collections, predictions, predictions, if you will. Cash balances. <clears throat> the next two slides um, are a snapshot in time uh, for, our, um, for our cash balances that we hold. Again, we really like to pay as you go for our capital improvements, which means we accumulate funds and then we budget them appropriately in our capital improvement pro project. So when you see the balance is moving up. It's to relate to timing of our disbursements and the timing of our projects. Um, I'm very proud of that fact. You will see our unassigned fund balance has been increased for the American Rescue Plan funds. You all approved us applying for those and applying for those to reimburse ourselves for our operating that we had done as allowed by the grant, which as we talked about was a little bit of a, a financial standpoint, a golden ticket. They allowed us to help us replenish, and it has to be for governmental operations, which is what we intend to do. So that's the big move there that you'll see with that. We had, we'd had a couple meetings, and we talked about it. You all approved us applying for it. So that money is ours now, <laughs> and uh, we're really delighted about that. And that will be rolled into your beginning balances when you look at your budget, which will be coming up in next month. This is, again, the second slide for the cash balances. These are our restricted funds. We did want to talk a little bit about our city property tax refund data. Uh, we received a new update, so we're informing you all of that, our city refunds now. And we're actually given parcel data, which I enjoy looking at, being a numbers person. We're about 1,580 parcels in the city thus far have been refunded a portion of their last year's real estate taxes. As you'll recall, real estate taxes run from January through December. From the time that the storm hit, if they qualified under the state guidelines to be uninhabitable, they were eligible for a refund for just that section that they could not use their property. So we're at about $123,000 citywide thus far. <clears throat> 
what they've stressed to us is that countywide there's 8,500 parcels that have been run refunded, and then countywide there's an additional 219 parcels that have their refund applications pending. Um, we do want to stress that the truth in millage notice, trim notices, we all um, love acronyms. <laughs> I don't, but. Um, <laughs> Well, they're a little hard to understand for the layperson, so I try not to use, we try not to use them here. But um, they will be mailed out August 24th. I cannot stress enough that I personally feel, and I believe that what we're getting from the property appraiser, he's leading the charge on this. I don't think that all the uninhabitable properties or all the properties have been reported. Um, he has specifically, he being the property appraiser, that there have been reports of unreported um, damages and condominiums out on the barrier islands. Now, we won't know our exposure until we move through the process and neither will the other municipalities and Lee County as a whole. So what we're cautioning, I fear that until people get that truth and millage notice that actually proposes what their taxes are gonna be on August 24th, it's not really going to uh, ring true to them. And then they actually, now that would be their first notice officially that this is what they're going to get billed in November. And even if they should miss that truth and millage notice, because as you all recall, you get it in the mail, it says this is not a bill. You're not, a, you don't pay it. What happens with that? A lot of times people just put it in a folder and if they don't note it and, and call and talk to the tax collector and the property appraiser at that time, they're gonna get the real bill in November. And that's when it comes due and they have from November to April 1st to pay. So this year, because of the impacts of the storm, the timing of the storm, I think we're not really going to be known a true picture of our tax base until, you know, after we adopt our, our millage rate and after we move into our next year because of the um, valuation adjustment board, even after a parcel is assessed in November, they can go to the tax, the property appraiser and challenge that value. Um, and then they start that process. So and that is not finished usually until March or May. I'm sorry I'm giving y'all a lot of dates, but just to let you know that there's some uncertainty this year uniquely because of Ian as we head into our, to our budget with respect to our tax base, real estate tax base. Are there, the value set on the first of the year? The value is January 1st. The value itself is January 1st, but the process for payment starts in November. We're talking about the assessed value. Yes, it is of after, January 1. After the storm. And just to let everyone know that the property appraiser is really, he wants, he's got a, a unique, wonderful website there just for Ian. You click one button and you send them an email and let them know about the damage in your property. They want you to keep telling them about that so they can make sure they accurately reflect that on your tax bill before you get the notice. So that's still available to anyone um, who feels that they have an impact that they need, have not reported yet. Well, thank you. Okay. And a reminder, um, our next meeting will be July, well, July 19th meeting. That's when we'll have our budget meeting. And each meeting thereafter, we'll probably be talking about the budget as we head into September, final adoption in September. Was there another? Uh, I know that the audit has probably been delayed because of Ian. Yes. Well, we, when do you anticipate that we'll have the comprehensive financial report? It will be in July. July. It will July. Do you anticipate by, by, yes. Reviewing it at the 19th meeting? Yes. Yes. In the July meeting. Yes, sir. And we have until 6.30 to finish that, so we're at the very end of it, so we will present it to you all in July. We're in compliance with? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are compliance. We have until 6.30 to do that. Yeah, I, th I typically believe that comes in March and April, but we were slightly delayed because of Ian, but we were a little ahead of the game before, but we're still in compliance with the state regulations. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, Lisa? Oh. Don't go away. <laughs> Two quick questions for you. Uh, you were talking about the um, initial decrease in revenues you haven't seen. Housing starts came out yesterday and surprised everybody because they're up 21.7% and they said of that almost 20% was here in Florida. Is that going to help us here? John says no. 
John says he'll let us know at the next meeting. It, 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 I think it's going to, it's a combination of, you know, obviously we don't have as much undeveloped land as some other municipalities or counties. So that sort of will dampen that impact on us. But for the state as a whole, economically and for our area, it's a great positive note. But we'll have to wait and see what, who walks in across the street. And we never know until they walk in across the street and ask for that new construction permit for yeah, sure I, if it's I in guess, here. So I guess my question is based on permits for new construction now, are we on track? Are we behind in Bonita? Sorry to spring this on you. I should have asked you yesterday, John. No, it's not a problem. Um, it, historically, when I say historically, basically for the past five or six, seven years, most of our permit activity and growth has been driven out east with several of those newer communities. Mm -hmm. Those newer communities are essentially built out. There's a little bit left, but it's a very small percentage. What we're seeing now is uh, interest downtown. We're seeing a lot of uh, hurricane-related activity. And what we're going to experience, and I've made a couple of comments uh, as a general perspective, is we're seeing that historical growth kind of come to, to an end because there really isn't vast tracts of land that you all are looking to, to develop or redevelop. And we're waiting for those areas that we have authorized development, Benita Grand Mine, some of those other areas that, that have uh, units available to come online. So there will be a period where things appear to be uh, really slowing down, but then there will also be a, an increase at some point in time. So. How long of a period of a lull that will be? I don't know. And that's really the, the question. Thank you. The things that are under construction now will not be on the Aguilar and Pax roll? Not until the certificate of occupancy is issued. It will be the January after the certificate of occupancy is issued. Okay, but we do get our impact fee while they're building. When they pull the permit for new construction across the street, yes, they pay whichever impact fee is applicable, some for parks and some for roads, depending on the, the use of the parcel. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Council. As, as Lisa stated, on our July 19th regular city council meeting, I just want to remind everyone that we will have the facilities report from our consultant at that meeting. And then once we... Uh, finish the city council meeting, we'll go right into our first budget workshop on the 19th. Um, I did want to um, get some direction from council regarding the July 5th city council meeting. As I understand, we do not have any pending zoning items for that meeting. Um, and I think that we will be in uh, full mode of preparing with our individual department directors for the budget. So um, unless there is anything pressing that council wants, we'd like some direction on how you feel about the July 5th meeting as, as far as we understand, you'll all be participating in the July 4th event the evening before. And, and the city hall will be closed on the 4th also. We will be closed so on the 4th. In the next day's Wednesday, so the, I, I suggest we cancel. Second. Any other comment? Roll call, please. Council Member Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Council Member Bogaz. Aye. Council Member Purden. Council Member Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. Aye. Council Member Corey. Aye. And then as always, should anything immediate or impending come up between them, we would advise you all and, and, and ask for a meeting if we needed one. Um, and then last but not least, on behalf of myself, um, Matt Feen and our entire staff, we wished, we'd like to wish Roger Desjardins all the best in his retirement. We appreciate the support and the guidance he's given to us and our staff and to, um, and to each of us. And we are very happy to congratulate Dave Harner on, on in his new role, and we very much look forward to continuing our partnership with him as well. So. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, very, very briefly, um, the given that we're canceling the um, July 5th meeting, and uh, if council members aren't aware, our, we are participating at the end of this month in a mandatory um, arbitration with the between the lawsuit out at the Three Hardworking Americans lawsuit that's uh, case number 21-CA-004285. Um, at the conclusion of that arbitration, uh, I expect uh, a decision by the arbitrator in fairly short order thereafter, and it may be necessary uh, for me to get your advice 
regarding any potential settlement or litigation strategy discussion. So what I'd like to do is, is ask at this time for an executive session to be held with myself, uh, the manager, and David Theriak, our outside counsel, ha handling that at a time to be determined as we work through the clerk's office, see what works for you, if that is necessary uh, following that arbitration, just so that we can get something calendared and, and noticed properly if we can't do it before the second meeting in, in July. So I just wanted to see if there's any objection to, to doing that, and, and I'll go forward and start reaching out to you about uh, those opportunities. And so it'll just be an opportunity for us to discuss outside of the public the, the status of the case and any decisions we need to make. When is that arbitration? Uh, it's, it's at the end of the month. I believe it is the 29th. It is the 29th. It's an all day. And uh, Councilman Corey, if you don't recall, you were selected by the council. Well, I, I recall. <laughs> I've been waiting with bated breath. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's by Zoom. So it's, that's, uh, there's no need to necessarily change any travel plans. Yep. Uh, all right. I think I've got direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Council reports. I have something. You got a report for us? Go ahead, Just Mary. A, Go I'm excited about uh, Fiesta Bonita. Um, looking forward to it. But it says dogs are allowed, and at Riverside, we don't allow dogs. So, Jesse, if you know, um, I think you know the person who um, is coordinating that to just highlight no dogs allowed so that we don't have unhappy people. And I was just wondering if. For the artist cottages, I mean, I think we should talk about it at budget in terms of perhaps raising the rent and making specific hours being open so that there's a pull toward that area. Um, and if, like, somebody who was eliminated could be added, like, could we do those cards? Normally, we do cards and we all vote and then we narrow it down, um, but uh, everything was out of order today, so I didn't mention it during the consent item, but I, I, I just think that I like Lynn, what is it, Ramono? I liked her work. I thought she should be considered in the front one of the, the cabins, but um, that's all. Appropriate for me to comment on that? Yeah. Yes, please, because you're on. Uh, you want to speak? Go sure. Ahead. I was going to address that. So we actually had six candidates. Yeah. Um, I was going to publicly thank the Art Public Places Board for spending an extra two hours this month individually reviewing them. And then we took three finalists and we recommended those. It's the first time that we've ever had that many candidates that were real artists. It was a very difficult decision. But the person that was chosen is actually someone who's lived in Benita that anybody who's been here for 20 years knows. And if you look at the sculpture out in our lobby, it's uh, Dave Kellum. And to have him back is kind of an artist in residence. But it was a very spirited discussion. They're all very qualified. And we've mm -hmm. advised them that if another cottage comes empty, that we would indeed uh, encourage them to reapply. Uh, we've only got the six cottages. So that being said, um, I was not reached out to by that individual. I don't know if she reached out to you after the meeting or not, Laura, but. No, no, I was just looking at the work. Um, so that's that's how it came about. We only had and one And everything's cottage. subjective. You okay, know. Yeah, yeah, just okay, one at a time. So we had the, the one cottage, that's all we had available. So we took who we thought would be there the most, which is very important that during events, we've had a t uh, cottage uh, folks that just weren't there, yeah. Dave Kellum, will definitely be there. So it's getting better. Um, as far as raising the rent, that has been discussed and that will become will be coming before council. Um, during Ian was not the time to raise no, the rents on folks. But that is going to be suggested and has been discussed by the Art and Public Places Board. Um, any other questions on Thank that? You. And I can clarify for Laura, your, your recollection of how um, RFPs, RFQs work it is correct on, on certain types in this um, it had been decided um, through the Art and Public Places Master Plan and Ordinance that the Art and Public Places Advisory Board 
would select the RFQ and make a recommendation to council. But there are many times when all of the proposals are brought to council and council makes their final decision. Um, this is similar to the outreach committee and they review the RFQ for um, um, Fiesta Bonita. So there, uh, you have different advisory boards have been delegated that ability to do so and then provide you the record. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irving. Jesse or anybody who wants to go next. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, number one, I just want to say, uh, is Nicole still? Skate park, awesome. I've gone by it twice this week, or uh, twice this week. Uh, really cool to finally see it come to fruition. For those of you who remember a long, long time ago, Peter Simmons, little kid who now plays University of Michigan football, he's eight times bigger at the time. He was about my size, hoping that the skate park would come to fruition. And now uh, it's actually not only to fruition, but it's packed. So it was pretty cool to go in there and see uh, see all those people in there using it. So good job, uh, Parks and Rec, and uh, congratulations on getting that up and moving. Um, number two, I would just like to ask staff uh, to, two twofold requests for LCSO stuff. Uh, number one, uh, understanding LPRs uh, and their somewhat limited cost but large impact. I would like to see staff kind of price out, you know, the most current models and what would be most advantageous, and then look at uh, having something together for us to look at at the next meeting, which would be a budget meeting, which would allow for us to uh, purchase LPRs uh, this with this fiscal year. And I think that we have enough money hanging out, we won't even have to go into unassigned fund balance, but I'd like to staff to kind of ferret that out and see if there's money hanging out, if we could do LPRs immediately. And then also number two, uh, kind of put together a package of what it would look like uh, for additional officer support, uh, similar to how we've done in previous years. Uh, as you know, this has kind of been an initiative since I got on, is to try to get us up to where we should be. Uh, you know, if we started the contract on 40,000, we're over 60 now. So, you know, half staff, we know the price is ballpark based on what we've done before in the budget, but, you know, those probably could have changed a little bit and, and just see what it would look like to potentially uh, put an increase into the budget that we'll be voting on so that we could get them uh, support for the following year. So, and that's all I've got. Ms. Fred? Well, I, I've got a report. Um, and, and I'm sure Chris Corey will want to add in to the information I give you. Um, I attended the workshops, almost all of them, for the uh, task force. But what's coming out is this, number one, there's a new deadline for proposals to be submitted to them. I, the ones that I, I've heard it three times from John, the uh, guy with Haggerty that works for the collaboratory, <laughs> of the 26th of July. I understand somebody else, I mean, 26th of June, which means that proposals will be going in before we, our next meeting, even if we're gonna have the meeting on the 5th of July, it would be too late for these things. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about some proposals I know of that are gonna be proposed. Hopefully, most of them you all will agree with. Uh, one of them is the YMCA. <clears throat> Their proposal came about uh, through the workshop process that is that there's a need to have more facilities where young preschoolers of the poor and the moderately poor especially, but of the workforce can be stashed someplace during the school year because that means if they don't have a place that a mother or a dad have to stay home with the preschool kids was brought up that the YMCA has a preschool facility that will accommodate 200 students. And that's nursery kids all the way up to just before they go into preschool. It's operated with certified teachers, certified teacher assistants. The Y cannot get staff sufficiently full to where they can accommodate the full 200 students. They're running about 60 to 80 students less than the building is designed to hold. So they're gonna put in a proposal 
and that was discussed <clears throat> in, fr in front of, uh, I think it was social services part of the workshop. But anyway, they all thought it was a good idea that anything can be done to increase the capacity to get more kids in there helps the businesses get people because we're shorthanded on workforce. <clears throat> so the, the proposal is very simple. What they're going to, and it's basically the other new information for me is the grants that you get, you have six years from the time they're awarded to spend the money. So they would put in a grant that would take them through teach six seasons and it would do two things would take the existing teachers they have, which are not being paid the same amount per person as they can get from the public school system. Brings them up to be competitive with them. Same way with teaching assistants, but it would also pay for the salaries <clears throat> of the additional teachers they need to get up to the full capacity of the building. Uh, so they're working on that as we speak. So that's one. Now, we can make this real simple. You can either vote on this or if there's an objection to this idea, then we'd have to have a roll call vote. So if anybody's got any objection to that, I would think it would be a good thing. <clears throat> Second thing, and this, this is what happened at the infrastructure committee, I actually was at their meeting last Friday, the John again was giving information out from other committees that John, who? John, he works for the collaborator, but he's on Haggerty's payroll. Is Romine or? Romine. Yeah. Uh, he said that there's comments being made that Bert may not get f supported. And you remember that something we did support because the latest tr trends in transportation is that there's going to be more mass transit and therefore we need to keep the railroad right away because they may want to re reactivate a railroad. What I did is I made the point to them at that meeting that that is not to worry about because if the right of way is bought, a provision of the purchase contract will be that they have to maintain the space for two railroad tracks because if they don't, then it's considered an abandoned right of way. And abandoned right of ways, half of it goes, the property goes to the people that live on the right side of the railroad and the other half go to the left side. And so by having that provision in the contract, that there always has to be the capability to put two railroad tracks in, uh, gets around that. Now, then I talked to John Scott, he's written a letter to him to explain it from MPO. Okay, the, <clears throat> the next one is uh, uh, one that should be pretty easy. We have an ordinance that we pass, the city unanimously pass. Which, which upgraded the flooding standards in Bonita Springs and also instituted the process where after a new development is designed, the stormwater management, that goes through a process of, we give them the software and it gets water modeled and until it produces a system that does not cause flooding in surrounding communities that are already there to flood any worse than they did in Irma or be better. If you go worse, they have to change it, hold more water. Uh, at a uh, infrastructure meeting, a lot of discussion about resiliency and what could we do, and I raised my hand. I said, one thing that could be done, we could make a proposal that they seriously consider adopting on a countywide, or at least some of the cities that are more flood prone, the same thing Benita did. And so basically it's a no cost deal for the most part. Might be a little bit of money in to, for them to upgrade their software for their particular conditions. So that's another one. Pardon? Two of them are 
Oh, okay. Oh, now, <clears throat> the last one is there's a proposal being made <clears throat> and submitted. I know uh, uh, a, a branch uh, uh, that it, it, it has a lot of interest by some, and that is to feed thy neighbor wants to put in a grant for purchasing an existing restaurant. And it's not the Wonder Garden restaurant. That's out. That's not the deal. And it would be to operate the restaurant, but also secondarily, it would be a, a place where especially the poor and the moderately poor could go in and be trained as part of the deal to be chefs, servers, restaurant managers, and all that. So that that's that's the ones I know of. Now, Chris may know of some other. I can give you a little, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, yeah uh, go ahead, Jeff. Just for a little background on what Fred's just discussed, um, I talked to Tony, who does the Feed Thy Neighbor, and essentially, but I mean, a real easy way to be looking at it is essentially what he's trying to do is, uh, if you know Lulu's Kitchen down in Collier that works with, uh, Saint, I think it's St. Matthew's House maybe, so essentially they have, you know, he could still be doing the Feed Thy Neighbor stuff during the day, and then at night they do like a low cost kitchen, but within that, they're employing people who then are able to get uh, workforce training via grant dollars through the federal government. In order to do that, his partnership has to be official with the city. So that's, that's the whole thing of where this is going. It, it's, so it's to stick those two things together, they can complement each other, uh, make the partnership more official so that thereby the, you can get workforce folks trained and simultaneously get poor folks fed uh, by utilizing the dollars from the Fed side. So that's, if that's helpful for everybody, yeah. that's kind of what he was saying. And, and I want to add this, as these proposals are finalized, they will be mailed to the city council and all that. So if anybody has any comments on them, I'll have the clerk do it so we're not breaking the sunshine law. But uh, anyway, those are the ones I know of. Chris probably knows of some others that might be in the woodworks. No, I, I would just comment that uh, at some point the task force is going to go back to the cities and say, you know, <clears throat> we've got all your initiatives, they call it projects, and now they're going to look for some way for the cities to prioritize. I mean, what basically, if you look at it, we got about $10 billion of initiatives and we got $1 billion worth of money. So at some point, we're going to have to, to prioritize what it is that we're going to want to push for. But when we go to push for it, what's good for Bonita Springs, we're all going to have to get behind it. Right. And so that when we come together as a council to do that priority, you know, it's going to be very important that we all agree and, and we all sign on to it and we all say that we, we support it because we're going to be very much in a competition with right. Fort Myers and Estero and Cape Coral and so forth. Yeah, and I, I want to point out one other thing that John Romain <laughs> said, and that was at the uh, infrastructure meeting, I believe, but he said, listen, the action plan is developed by the task force and put together and it'll be in pretty good shape as we get into the early part of December. He said, clearly there will be more proposals there than the 1.1 1 .1 will cover. It is the intent of the task force leadership uh, as well as Haggerty that they're going to be looking at other funding sources to augment this. So you're really not looking at 1.1. 1 .1. It might take a little longer to get some of the others, but. So it's, it's, it's for the most part. It's well, they have found another 400 million. So yeah. we're not going to be dealing with 1.1 billion. We're going to be dealing with 1.5 billion. Yeah. And so there's another 400 million <coughs> on the table. So, uh, but you know, it's December is going to be here before we know it. And there's going to be a lot of work done between now and then. I would say that with respect to the rail line, the most important thing that can get done is for the county to acquire the right of way you know we can you know if we if it's needed 10 years from now it's a 130 foot right of way there's more than enough room to put rail lines on it 
if 10 years from now, let's say the county decides that we need to have a commuter train coming out of uh, uh, Fort Myers down to North Naples. Another thing to remember is that rail line does not go all the way downtown to Naples. It goes down into Benita, uh, into North Naples about two miles. So that's all there is. It doesn't really provide full commuter service down to Naples. So anyway, if, if the county can acquire the land, that's the most important thing that can happen now. No, and no Nigel. I was going to say, Fred, did you have anything else? In no, I don't. Do you have anything, Nigel? Short. Thank you. Short and sweet. You're welcome. So, uh, first of all, thank you to uh, council and staff. I attended the Florida League of Cities training, um, and I don't know if everybody up here has done it. I would absolutely recommend that. Um, I learned more in two days about what um, I should or should not be doing as a council member. Um, it's an incredible course. You spend nine hours a day and they're feeding with a fire hose, but I can't say there was a single half hour segment where I wasn't learning something. The people that put it on do a great job. I've heard you talk about home rule. I learned a lot about home rule and how we could easily give that up. So it was, um, it was a wake up call for me. So I appreciate you all sending me there. I had, uh, when I got back, I had a couple of my constituents who called me and I want to defend our council and publicly because apparently several hundred people watch us on TV. And the comment was made that uh, we just seem to sit up here for the most part. We don't argue very much and we just nod our heads a lot and just approve things. So letting them know that uh, because of our staff preparing us a week in advance, because we spend our own time researching things and working with staff members. And I heard this at Florida League of Cities. Our staff and our city is very, very well thought of in the state because believe it or not, not all cities are run as well as Benita Springs, but letting the public know that we're doing our homework and that the only time that we're council members is not sitting up on this dais. So those of you that are at home and think that that's all we do, you're wrong. Um, so, and I, I thank my fellow council members for the work that they do. Um, I, there's a letter here that everyone received prior to the meeting and it's from the Center for the Arts um, or for the Center for the Arts. This is not money that's being requested from the city. They're applying for a state grant and would like our blessing. They asked me if we would do a uh, letter of recommendation and I would ask council to uh, approve that because they're going out asking for grant money that will come back and directly benefit our uh, aftercare program, the scholarships that they do for our disadvantaged youth in the city, continuing the work. I would comment and uh, or commend our new uh, Benita Springs Center there, its executive director. She's making a real point of reaching out to people in the community, um, looking for funds, not just from the city, but she wants to create a relationship with council and I think that will benefit us. Um, I know she's already developed a relationship with Nicole back there and uh, our parks and rec director. So it seems like a genuine effort on her part to look for other programs that will supplement things we do in the city. So I'm asking. If I can, may I make a motion? to support what Nigel is suggesting. It's just a letter of recommendation. Right. Second. Yes, and if we did that, would you still need us to individually do them? Or no, just one letter. One? Okay, so I'm in support of that. Fred second. Councilmember Bogaz. Aye. Councilmember Purden. Aye. Councilmember Carr. Aye. Mayor Steinmeier. I'm, I'm confused. What are we voting on? It's a letter of recommendation that the city, you have a copy of the letter. Yeah, I got it 30 seconds before we opened the meeting. Well, okay. I got it last night, my apologies. All it is is a letter we're saying that we work hand in hand with the Biddy Springs Center for the Arts, which we do, and that we're endorsing their request for funding from the state. It doesn't affect the city of Biddy Springs. They're not asking us for money, it's grant money. I'm just curious as to we're voting on something that wasn't on the green sheet. It wasn't on the. You're, you're able to do that as um, you're able to, if the uh, council member brings the item up for request. The yeah. reason for the. Uh, the okay, I vote yes. Yeah, thank you. The, the only reason I apologize is they have to present it by tomorrow. Council member Corey. Aye. Council member Fullick. Aye. Deputy Mayor Forbes. Aye. Thank you all. Uh, let's see. Jamie, you got any for us tonight? Friends real quick today? also. Um, I just on uh, what Jesse said, piggyback on that. Nicole, great job with this. It looks it looks really uh, amazing, and it's really neat to see everyone back out there. And 
um, just pulling up there in general and seeing the fields of what I remember them and what they look like now, it's, it's great to see. And as Chief DeWitt stated, they're hoping to have Station 27 up and running. They're hoping for August, but um, I know the, the firefighters there are looking forward to their house opening again. And um, the Engine 26 that I had talked about in the past is up and in service now. Very good. That's it. Did we, you did you already, Laura, did you? Yes, Yes, sir. you were done. Everybody done? Yeah, it will. Yeah. Anything else, folks? Public Anything? comment. No. There we go. Oops. Public we're, comment. We're adjourned. Okay. Thank you all. No public comment. Oh, public comment. We got well, one public. There was nobody, yeah. <laughs> They're all staff. Except for well, no, Ron. Ron, you have anything to say? Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs>